afternoon, everybody. I hope that people are having a good day. Uh, I've got things set up a little bit different now. Um, I, I've got uh, some different functionality in place now, so that uh, I'm trying to refine as I go, as, as uh, I've expressed again and again and again. But uh, we're getting there, you know. Little, little, little bit by little bit. So I hope people have had a good day. <clears throat> While my voice might be cracking, this is actually the first day where I have felt so much human. It's been a long few weeks. Two, three weeks now. But here we are. We're here. Uh, we've got people saying hi. Linda says hi. Hi, Linda. How you doing? Um, welcome aboard. Uh, to Linda and to everybody else that might be popping in. Today's music of choice is the Thievery Corporation. If you're not familiar with them, give them a try. French band. Um, the album Swadade is the album that I'm listening to today. It's a pretty great album. And Zuni Zoom, hello. Welcome aboard. Okay. All right. So uh, this is today's page that I posted. Let's just jump right into things. This is today's page that I posted. It was the page that we started yesterday drew in simple pencil and inked in with a Fidenis kick pen and uh, and then the coloring and effects and stuff like that, I did all that digitally. So, you know, this was a fun one to do. The idea was, the suggestion was from Rachel Fleming and it was two seniors meeting at their 60th school reunion, one with a hearing problem, the other with memory problems, I think. Um, yeah, so that was a lot of fun. So thank you for the suggestion, Rachel, and uh, hope you're well and, and that everybody else is well that's uh, engaged with us here at the, the stream. <clears throat> okay, so I'm going to switch the camera up and uh, put the overhead on. So I've got, uh, just let me just, uh, give me a second here while I uh, move the camera over and uh, there we go. Look at this business, huh? Also, zooming in. I'm able to zoom in now, so hopefully people can see things a little bit easier now. Yeah, about time, I know. But, okay. So, uh, I've got some regular old typewriter paper here. Uh, what I wanted to chat... <clears throat> what I wanted to chat about today is um, how you can pretty much figure out how to draw most things uh, using simple shapes. And while that sounds, oh yeah, just, just do shapes. Um, basically the gist of it is this, and this is what I tell to people that are starting on their drawing journey and uh, are having challenges in their drawing journey, which we all are, you know, we're all in a state of growth, right? But if you break, everything down and when you're looking at them look at everything as three shapes it's a square a triangle and a circle now for those of you that are already jumping ahead let's just nip it in the bud as you get more sophisticated you're going to see these as a cube a pyramid and a sphere. Okay? So, but let's just start here. Let's start with these three basic shapes. So, the objective game that I like to play initially, right off the hop, is uh, look around wherever you are. And if you look around the environment that you're in, specifically this, this really applies if you're inside a, uh, a, an area made by people. But even if your window view looks out onto the environment around you, you'll still notice this. Um, you can break down most things into these three shapes and exact durations therein. So what I mean by that is, if you're looking around the room, okay, and you see on a wall, you know, a clock, you know, and it's got its, it's, got its hands, it's telling its time, it's got the numbers that are spaced throughout it, right? But that clock is a series, usually, of circles. Now there might be some ornate business up at the top and some flourish to it. Is this appearing? Yeah, it's appearing on screen. Good. 
and some little a little bit of flourish at the top. Let me use a different color to start. Just a little bit easier. Easy like Sunday morning. Okay, so if uh, if you look at everything as these the base shapes, then you realize that you can break everything down in in their environment into these basic forms, like you know whatever the desk that you're sitting at. The, when you really step back and examine it, it's a series of squares or exaggerated squares, as I say, or rectangles. Um, or combinations of those shapes therein. Like oftentimes you'll see in an environment where you've got, let's say your desk that you're sitting at, and even if it's on a diagonal axis, and if it's in a corner like so, your desk is still gonna have this form and function that follows these basic shapes because what we're really looking at here is, you know, you know, a setup of squares, right? You know, and when you look at the object in, within an environment, you can start to break down all of the components of it and put these images together by memory as wrote. So let's say it's got shelves in it or, or here's a couple of drawers or whatever. It's just a series of additional shapes, okay? Jim says, I wear my clock on my neck. Boy. Okay, there you go. Whap, whap. Anyways. Um, so, so if you look at anything around you in your environment, you should be able to figure out structurally how to break those things down in these three components. That when you're looking at cars and you're seeing that the front shape of a car and you realize that it's just some exaggerated forms that are all piled up together of these three basics. You're seeing a lot of squares in there, but when you're looking at the corner and you're seeing this rounded part on the bumper, this is where basically your circle application starts coming in. And it's a case of figuring that out. You know, when it comes to the front part of the car, there's always this little raised bit of business on the front hood. Now we've got modern cars that are far more organic so you're going to see a lot more rounding off of everything and more organic shapes applied into the structure of of said vehicle you know but it's all, the same point still reside is that because this is just an exaggerated circle and then um, you know you've got your your front windows on your car you've got your wheel well for for the tires like it's just breakdowns no matter what the object is of these three shapes. So, and the same goes for when you look at a bottle, let's say that you've got uh, your, for your water bottle, okay? Your water bottle is a series of these circular shapes starting from the top down and they flange out, but they're still these circular shapes. Now, depending on how organic said bottle is, the body of bottles for the most part tend to be this large column part, but, but you know, inherently you can still break that down into the square shape. When you look at a bottle from the top, you're gonna to see these different layers of circles. When you look at the bottle from the side, it generally looks like a square with a triangle with a smaller square on top. You know, so, Think about objects built up of these basic shapes. And then as you get more elaborate with it and you want to give it form and you want to give it volume, this is when you transition over to considering things on this second tier, not just as these basics, but it's important to start there, no doubt about it. But when you start getting more involved in your drawing, start thinking about these objects with volume. So, I think that makes sense. Um, so what, what that means is the more objects, the more things that you look at around the world uh, that you, you, you know, live in, it's the same one we all live in, um, you're going to see more and more elaborate things that you're going to want to draw. Sometimes it takes the patience to do so. Sometimes it takes some real 
consideration on your part and how to break down those shapes. Um, but again, it's all just practice and becoming more and more tuned into the components that make up whatever it is that you're trying to draw. <coughs> Jim says, I find myself drawing lots of beer bottles in my projects, tables and chairs also. Yeah, you tend to get an affinity for certain items and certain objects. Yeah. Whether it's the subject matter of your work or if it's just something that you tend to gravitate towards locating in scenes. There's a number of different reasons. <clears throat> but this, you know, the same principle here applies to animals. <coughs> and, you know, faces, human beings, trees, um, even landscapes. And so we'll walk through this uh, bit by bit. If anybody has anything that's always bothered them, let's break it down and figure it out together. Um, so feel free to make a comment in the chat, and we'll look at it from a different perspective, maybe. But let's say a tree. When you look at a tree, when we're kids, we draw trees like this. Very simplistic. And the beauty of this is that if you look at architectural designs, Oftentimes, you'll see that they still draw trees like this. And it's largely because the structure of the building or whatever the object that they're designing is the, the thing that's of you know, most importance. And this is just a flourish. It's kind of like a garnish on a plate. So they're not really worried about the shape. So they break them down into their primitive cell. Some people get more and more ornate with everything as they go. But generally, you can simplify over time. Uh, one of the things that you can look at with a tree, though, is think about how a tree is built. And a tree is built, so let's break it down really abstractly, okay? Am I still in frame? I am. Good. So if you look at a tree, you can look at the bottom of the trunk of the tree, like a pyramid, like the, the triangle or pyramid in shape. Now, underneath that is all the trunks as they move through you know, as, as they root it into the ground and then they, they draw up nourishment from the soil and, and some moisture as well. And they draw it up through the body of the tree and spread it out all the way out to the foliage. So if, as long as we understand the structure of the tree, we know that these roots move down into the ground. Now, I'm going to be really basic, like I said. So then the body of the tree, as it moves up and it expands out as it grows, and then it breaks off into smaller parts I'm just going to draw over top of other things. I hope you don't mind. It breaks off and it expands outwards, but as it moves up, the plant, the, the branches get smaller and they divide out and then divide out again, you know, and they go in different directions because the whole point of a tree and how it divides itself is that the tendrils of the fingers of the tree are spreading out like so, so that all the leaves can capture as much as they can for the nourishment of the tree, water and sunlight, in, in this case, and nutrients in the earth in the bottom part. But what actually happens underneath the soil is the same thing as we're going to show here. So if you look at these shapes, because we're looking at it in the abstract, it's just a bunch of wedges, Another word for triangular shapes is a wedge. And, you know, squares all placed together in different, different sizes as it builds up the structure of the tree. It's the most basic way I can ever think to explain to people on how to draw a tree. You know, and it's the thing that I think is the most liberating about it to me is that when you look at objects like this, just as specific patterns and things like that, then it starts to become less, I can draw this, but I can't draw that. Well, think about how you've applied yourself to drawing this. A lot of times when people learn to draw people, they learn to draw people as a series of shapes, as organic form, you know, organic forms, like eggs for the head and things like that. And what is an, uh, an egg for the head? But it really is a circle with a triangle that's been rounded off by a smaller circle. That gives you your egg shape. So 
when we think about things in that context, as challenging as, challenging as it is, and as challenging as it is to develop your skills so that you can draw the objects that you find are difficult to you. It's just, it's just practice and application. And it's not to say that you're, well, I can always draw these things, but I can't draw those things. Oh, sure you can. I, I'm not dismissing it like that. But what I am saying is that figure out the components of how you design this in your head and draw it with your hands. And how can you break this object down, this person down, this field down, you know, whatever it is you're drawing. So <clears throat> let me catch up on things. Uh, Chris says, hello, everyone. Hi, Chris. Welcome aboard. And then uh, Zuni says, I find myself drawing organics more than people in structures. That's fantastic. Now, there's a, there's a thing about one or the other that we tend to feel more comfortable with. You'll see that there'll be illustrators that are very comfortable with designing environments. You'll see that there are illustrators that are very comfortable drawing ornate architectural buildups and the landscape around them is secondary, rocks at best, you know, a lot of the times. Um, and you'll find that there's people that have an affinity for naturally drawing people, or they might develop that affinity for drawing people and to drawing people in their environments. So like Jim uh, Luan referred to earlier, where you start drawing a lot of tables and the uh, items that are on tables. So because your primary thing is, you know, the interplay between the people and the space that they're in. So it's not to say that you can't draw the other, but there's absolutely nothing wrong with the things that you gravitate towards. And if you gravitate towards certain things because the other things are harder, that's understandable. But it doesn't mean that you can't break through whatever that block is that's keeping you from drawing those things. So when you look at a landscape, let's let's go to the landscape for a second here. Is this is everybody seeing this okay? Is there uh, yeah, I've got the zoom going, so it's tightly focused on the image, and I hope that helps. Um, so, I'll turn the light up if that's of any benefit. So, a landscape, if we break it down into a frame of reference here, we put it down into a square. When you look at a landscape, and let's say, let me do it a little bit larger for you. If you've got, yeah, we're in, we're in frame, okay. So if you've got a landscape where you know you've got a tree, now rudimentarily you're going to draw a tree with big branches on it, and then there's going to be maybe some bushes around it, maybe another random bush here, and then diagonally comes this stream that's moving along there, and it's got the occasional rock sitting in it. And you've got your horizon line, and in the back you've got some mountains. So there's your really basic and abstract piece. Um, Jim says, those little details are what makes Gary Hodges work so engaging as well. Yeah, that's the important stuff. I mean, that really is. It's, it's the things that once we develop a little more additional sophistication in what it is that we're drawing, our storytelling gathers more depth to it. Paula loves artists joining us. Hi, Paula. Welcome aboard. Uh, listening in from up in the balcony. Well, welcome. Okay, so as we're breaking everything down into circle squares and triangles, we understand the basic idea of our composition of our of our of our field. Now, what you'll see a lot of people do is try to look at it more of an organic way. Now, I showed you this really rudimentary way of breaking down a tree. The part that I didn't talk to you about was when we look at a tree from above and we see how there spirals out these little forms, these reducing lines of the tree trunk itself. These are the roots that go into the ground. And then so as they're spacing throughout the environment, you know, finding purchase into the soil wherever they can, well, you know, when you look at it from above, you don't consider those things. But if this is the basic part of the tree, and as the tree goes higher up, and it starts dividing off into 
you know, it's other, uh, the branching, I'm sorry, up the trunk. Okay, and then as those branches move off and they divide off is where you start seeing the complexity of the tree coming into place, you know, and this is where they start filling out the air. And so you're going to, of course, lose all of the material that's down at the bottom. But what you're going to develop is a greater understanding of the tree and space, you know, in, in the space of your image. So we know that trees generally don't just grow straight up and down in, say, a park environment. Um, you got to think about all the additional factors and think about the tree. Now, often in park environments and here in London, if you see an old tree that's standing on its own there and nothing really grown around it, generally, a lot of times, you'll see that tree growing at a crazy angle. Okay? And so it's just a simple thing like this. And because we understand that this is just shapes, if, it, if you want me to break it down, I can break it down further like so. Okay? And then... You know, as you look at all of these forms, and we understand that the branches space out now, and they find their purchase to get light. So we've started to design our, you know, a, a better, more sophisticated tree than this guy up here. And then it becomes a place of clothing it and, and branches, smaller and smaller branches as we go along. And considering though that aspect of it, but then you want to clothe it in leaves. So the truth of the matter is, you see less and less and less of the structure of the tree because those leaves are all going to cover it up. And they're going to follow that organic pattern, that organic shape of smaller and smaller and different circles that define the structure of the tree in accordance to where you've put those branches. <clears throat> Excuse me. Oh, says thank you. I think I will. I, I'm sorry. I will use this same approach to start digital drawing practice. Great. Yeah. I mean, if if you can start to think of any objects in general as as just the shapes, just the organic shapes of them, and it will open up for you all kinds of opportunity for you to draw different things. And you become less and less reliant on source imagery, say, or you become less and less reliant upon, um, you know, I got to draw the perfect tree, so I have to find the perfect picture to do it from. Y yes, or you can, you know, now I realize that not everybody has this facility, and I apologize if you don't, but um, if you can just think of what a tree looks like, if you have to close your eyes, if you have to, whatever it is that you have to do, but if you can just consider a tree, or you can see it, consider the park that you walk through. If you're having a hard time remembering that, bring a small sketch pad or something like that with you. If you've got an envelope, you know, with a bill in it, in your pocket, scribble on the envelope, it doesn't matter. But think about the tree outside in the park and how it has a strange shape to it and that everything isn't in this uniform way where we have the bushes all working in correlation with one another because nature is haphazard and nature is always trying to find a purchase for life so you're going to have you know hedges that are growing up in front of the tree so part of your tree is going to be covered up there with this hedge and, you know, maybe you'll see a little bit of its network. I'm going to try to keep this simple in, in the organic shapes of it. So then you've got another bush that's in behind, and you've got some, some lichen and moss that's growing up around the base of the tree. You know, all of these different parts of your composition are vying for prominence in your composition. Everything is in front of everything else. The way you can look at it is, if you draw the sheet, if you draw a tree on a layer in a digital program or on a sheet of plastic in, 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 a, in a physical way, you take another layer 
a plastic or digital and lay it over top of it and draw the bush. And just draw the bush. And then figure out what's more interesting, that bush and where the allocation of it is, uh, how you place it in front of the tree, overlapping part of the tree's uh, base, or in behind the tree where the tree overlaps in. But you can play with that and start to move your image, move your composition around and find what is for you making the most sense. So rather than having a uniform flat plane of bushes now, now we've got, you know, some inv involvement here in, inside the space. You know, if I'm going to get more and more uh, engaged in it, then, you know, I'm going to try to make sure that I can separate these planes so that you can see that this is in front of this and this is in front of that. You know, and, I, and ideally it builds up an image like that with a little bit more sophistication. Zuni says, I find myself drawing dead tree forests with mushrooms and rocks, but always hide faces in the branches. Well, that's a natural human tendency. We look for recognizable images. We are a creature of patterns. And as a creature of patterns, there's a couple things that we tend to do. We, we like uniformity. We like symmetry. But we also like to look for potential dangers or potential faces. And faces from human beings as a form of communication, faces from other species as a form of danger. Well, humans is a form of danger too, let's be honest. We're misbehaving monkeys, but... You know, that's the, those, the natural tendency. So all the time, you'll see examples in, in uh, nature. In uh, China, there's these three prominent, like there's promontories of rocks that are just jetting out from a cliff face. This really weird organic shaped form to them that kind of looks like buried submarines sticking out of the top of a hill. They're not. They're rocks. They're a weird... Um, placement of rocks, probably from the movement of glaciers or probably from the movement of some geodesic movement where they were pushed up from, from below and they just have this structural shape to them. And it just happens to be interesting how they're placed in nature, but they're still just rocks, right? Well, there's a second sphinx in Bosnia. No, that's just a pile of rocks if you're recognizing the shape of the sphinx in. Um, well, there's a large pyramid in Bosnia. Again, it's it's just, and there's another one in Antarctica. These are really just geoformations that are a little more recognizably patterned into looking like pyramids, that's all. But we find ourselves drawn to those things. So when we look at whatever the basic things are that we're drawing, as we allow ourselves to break these down, and these shapes, but then start understanding. So this would be the breakdown part, right? And this would be understanding the complexity of a thing, understanding the object. Okay, so uh, it's not just tree from this vantage point. It's tree while we're lying on the ground looking up at it. It's tree as we're imagining ourselves up in the branches looking down through it. And when we have a, a greater comprehension of how things look and how things work, and we give ourselves a moment to walk around them or to hold them in our hands and to turn them over, then it makes us more available to draw them. I hope, uh, I hope that makes some sense for people. Um, and again, if you've got anything, you know, you've got some interest in drawing but have had some challenge to do so, let me know and we'll break it down. Uh, I'm just going to grab a stapler. Now, I'm stapler, I'm sorry, a sharpener, pencil sharpener. Now, this is a rather organically shaped pencil sharpener. And so it has this, this wonderful form to it and shape to it that, that just naturally ergonomically uh, sits comfortably and, and for you to hold it. And that's what these little bits on the side are for. It's not just a grip, and a lot of people don't realize it's also to do this and tar tighten up the point on your pencil without having to stick it in and shorten your pencil by sharpening. 
Um, anyhow, <clears throat> so, so we've got this sharpener. Now, if we want to draw said sharpener, one of the ways that we can do that is by looking at it in, in the shapes, okay? Just in the forms of the sharpener and breaking it down into that, that you know, you could form boxed rectangle, a cubed rectangle, whatever you want to call it. Um, now, with that, we know that two-thirds of the way across it is where there's this division of the body of it and the top of it, he says, and drops shavings under his picture. Um, so, we know that that exists there. And then we know that that carries on on this next plane, not just the plane at the top, but this plane as well. So we draw that accordingly. But when we look at the object, you can see this rounded edge to it. Almost like there's, a, you know, if you look at it as a circular shape here in your mind, or if you have to lightly pencil that onto your drawing, that's fine. But it allows you to draw that softened edge on your image. So now we've got this organic shape. And while it seems flat at first, it's actually not. There is a, imagine a large circle that cuts into this and softens that shape at the top. And again, there's another one here. So we want to place this bubbling into it. And this raised lip, and if you can look really close, there's a, tri a triangular shape at the top there. So we want to place that in. So now as we're drawing our sharpener, and then we add in all of these pieces on the side. Okay, so well, and just to, just to give it a little more structure, I'll go over it in black for you. So now we know we've got this more complex shape, right? From these basic shapes that we broke it down into. I should be around here. Okay. So that's, you know, just about anything that we can think of we can evaluate this way and divide it up, break it down, and then figure out how we to replicate it. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, Chris says, yesterday night, I got my new stylus and brush device. It's nice. No lagging and it responds to pressure. Fantastic. That's absolutely fantastic. That's the way it should be. Um, that's great. It's gonna enable you to engage in you know, the impulse of having your tablet with you and wherever you, you are, you can just gesticulatively draw or try to sketch something or if you have a second to just doodle, that's, that's, that's great, that's perfect. Jim says, whatever I'm drawing on my iPad, I'm looking out for saber tooth tiger attacks. Well, that's an important thing to do, Jim. <laughs> I'd like to see you draw that, Jim. Let's do it together. Okay, now we're gonna draw today's suggestion. Oh, I'll write it down darker so you can see it. Today's suggestion is whenever, when, holy, let's spell, whenever I'm drawing on my iPad, I am looking out for saber tooth tiger attacks. Okay. So here's our impulsive suggestion. All right. Now, if we look at this, let's look at, let's place Jim someplace where he might be using his iPad. Let's say a cafe, a coffee shop of some kind. I just feel like that'd be a place where Jim would be using his iPad. You know, but, uh, okay, so if you get an opportunity, please go and check out Jim Ryan's work. He's a brilliant animator. Uh, he's got a YouTube channel where you can see all of his films for free. 
And he has about 40 of them, 50 of them, maybe. I don't know. But okay, so let's uh so let's start off with uh we'll do a really basic drawing here of of Jim. All right, there's Jim. Hi. Okay. There's our there's our stick figure, Jim. Now, um, so Jim, as he sits in a cafe, and we're gonna just use shapes for this. All right. So as we've got Jim sitting in a cafe, we'll place him sitting down. Now, here's a way you can do this for your own support. Now, if you're doing this digitally, you can draw. Jim sitting in a chair and on another layer and again traditionally this let's apply this plastic sheets Jim sitting in a chair and on another plastic sheet you can draw the table Jim sitting at okay so I'll show you what I mean by that Jim sitting in a chair we realize the the form that the body breaks down into into these circular and triangular and square type shapes. So as Jim is sitting at this chair, we'll tuck his one leg under his other. And we'll give him some pants today. It's not what I'm drawing Paul Bay. Um, <clears throat> so as we draw Jim's ankles and as his foot sits under the table, and you notice it's just random shapes that I'm drawing, but circles squares and triangles okay so now we've got jim seated and then and on another layer i'll use another color for you how's that let me grab another color first red red should show up <clears throat> so so here we've got jim i haven't drawn his eyes or his arms in for a reason now if jim is sitting in a chair let's think about the shape of a chair. A chair has a square base that we sit on. It has square sides that flange out a little bit, kind of triangular even, right? Um, but it's basically a, a cube, a flared out cube, right? And then the back of said chair is again another one of these objects, but the angle of the back of the chair tends to tilt back at a 15 degree axis. So it's again, like a, imagine like a little triangular shape that's not actually there. And that helps you figure out the placement of your back of your chair. So it looks like it's organic and comfortable for Jim to draw and to sit in. Okay, so now we draw the legs of this of said chair. Now we remember that legs aren't just lines legs have form okay and if it helps you remember them as really long rectangles and that there's this rounding at the top as they move into the next just like circles into the next rectangular shape we're starting to draw the frame of the chair okay so when we take that into consideration and we draw the chair in space See, here's our imaginary lines for the cube. Okay, and then we draw the back on said chair. Now we can be more ornate around the edges of the top of the chair. But here's Jim sitting in his chair in, his, in the cafe or wherever he is. Now, when you draw the, I'll pull in on it a little bit more just so you can see, excuse me, a little more clearly the rough the rough aspects that we have to it. Not the greatest focus, but I'm working on it. I'm sorry. Okay, so now we've got on this plane behind Jim is the chair. On this plane in front of the chair is Jim. Now, on I had another color here. <clears throat> Excuse me. So in front of Jim is going to be this third plane. We know that Jim is sitting at a table. Now we can draw that table two ways. We can draw it round or we can draw it square. It depends on the shop. Different shops have different shaped tables. Some of them are kidney shaped or 
<coughs> which is just, you know, emulates the kidney in your body. It's a kidney-shaped pool. Um, okay, so we think about where the placement of the table is in space in relationship to the human body. Now, I'm uh, I'm five foot eighteen, so because of that, chairs or tables and things tend to sit lower on me. But that's just because I'm, you know, I'm a larger person, and so you see more of the trunk of my body in relationship to the table. But generally, for most people, it sits around the just above your navel. Okay just above the navel. So when we think about where the navel would be located on Jim's body here, which is actually, if you look at it, where your hips are on your body, if you feel your body like this, and then draw a 45 degree line from each of your hips, and you're gonna hit your belly button. It's the same as when you look at your um, clavicles and how they move down on a slight slope, 15 degree angle to your coccyx here. But if you run your, that 45 degree in, in opposite to that, there's the very base of your neck or your Adam's apple, depending on the prominence of it for, you know, for men, it tends to be more prominent. But there's all this geometric patterning in the human body, but we're just gonna look at it in relationship to the navel for how it's, the gym sits at the table. And so if we, using that consideration, draw this table that's in front of Jim now, and let's put it on the same, you know, angled plane as the chair, okay? And we're using this navel measurement as the center of our table. Jim sits very orderly at his tables. And so we're gonna draw this large square shape on an angle in front of Jim. Okay, and it's going to end up covering his knees, and that's okay. But because we know all that's there, but it doesn't necessarily need to be there for our drawing. Now, whether it's a central pole position for the table, which it can't be in this case because we, where we've allocated Jim's legs, if it's a central pole, you'll see people's feet tend to sit on either side of either the base of the, the support in the table or... Um, they sit around the center of the table, depending on how long their legs are. But in this case, we're gonna give the table the same sort of a position as we did with the chairs, All right? We're gonna post them down from, from the edges of the, um, <clears throat> the corners of the table. So let's look at the side of our table, imaginary line going across there, imaginary line going across there, and then we know for a fact that even though you're not going to see the whole thing, there's the imaginary line that sits in front of Jim as he's pulled up to the table here. So now we've got the structure of where he is. This is where I jump back. There's a reason I didn't put his, his, uh, his arms in before. And that is because now we understand that Jim's body has form. We understand that. We know that. Right? And so here's Jim's arms as they're off the side of his body. Ball joint on the shoulders. If you really want to break it down into basics, you can get more and more elaborate with the placement of musculature on the arm. But that level of sophistication comes with time. We're doing a basic one here. So as we move Jim's arms forward so that his elbows are hitting the table. So here's his elbows. And then we make those choices. We know a reason of drawing a circle here at the elbow is it's a thing that I find helps people realize that um, it's not just the form moving this way in the arm, it's the form that is the second segment of the arm. And when you're at the elbow, if you imagine there's a circular joint here, it's there kind of is, there's kind of a triangle in there too. We'll get into that more later. And then there's this tube that comes out this way and a tube that comes out that way. Straight arm, still two tubes. Now the, the tube for the lower part of the arm, if you want to get elaborate, there's more of a conical shape to it, a little more of a cone shape to it than a straight circle. Or a, it's almost like a square form but with a slight triangular aspect to it, right? So if we put his one hand sitting here resting on the table, all right, and we'll 
curl up his fingers and tuck them underneath there just for interest's sake. And then his second arm, which still follows the same provision that we've established for the first one. Now, I'm not drawing the hand in for a reason. And the reason is this. When we're talking about this forward plane, and Jim draws on his iPad, okay? So as Jim's drawing on his iPad, now I don't know if it's Jim's iPad, I would think that there would be a raised lip to his iPad as it sits on the table in front of him. So we'll look at the object like so, okay? And then we'll look at as though we've got, see there's the other imaginary triangle that we're not going to see in our drawing. So here's Jim's iPad and the, I believe there's a bit that curls underneath because it's a fold over thing. So and it curls underneath. So we think about the fact that these three segments when you ex that, that make up the covering lid of the iPad. So when you fold them out, they do like so. And they drop down and cover the iPad there, but then you can fold them under as well, like so. And then you've got your resting position. See, we just think about the objects, right? So as we place the iPad here, now we need to think about Jim's hand in space and the relationship of his pen as he's drawing on his iPad. So our drawing of Jim, maybe I want to see a little more of the chair, right? But our drawing of Jim, <clears throat> and just for interest's sake, is now, here's the, the table, right? And we'll draw, well, let's do this for Jim as well. Probably thirsty, so we'll give him a coffee cup. We're just thinking of how a coffee cup is, it's like a square that has a slight triangular bent to it. And there's a organic roundness to it because we know from the top down view of a coffee cup, it looks like that. So we give it that shape. And then the coffee cup handle, while well, from the top down, it looks like this. Coffee cup handle is almost like a circle and a triangle. Okay, so we place the coffee cup handle on the side of this cup. And then we'll put a table, uh, a plate here from where he ate a croissant. So as we're inking this and we're putting down these pieces of information, and now that we've done all this laying out with our drawing, okay, so as we're putting together our composition in its more finished form. And get a little more elaborate. I'm trying to keep it basic though. So as we draw person sitting at table, we're able to do so because we've thought about I'll get into the hands in a second. Um, we've thought about everything and how it fits in the shape, or space, I'm sorry, how all the shapes fit in the space. That's a terrible line. Why am I shaking hand today, folks? <clears throat> I'm gonna put a couple of random shapes in order to represent papers that are on this table, right? Ah, PGM. So, um, Whoops, and let's put the chair in. And while we're here, we know that the one leg of the chair is going to show through. And we'll give an edge to our table. So I dropped the ball halfway there, folks. I meant to do this part. And we'll put our table leg. Uh, Janet Young isn't. Uh, rolling uh, around wherever she is watching me do this because uh, I'm not using a ruler. I apologize, Janet. So we're looking at the fact that the table legs are squares. 
right? And then we let uh, a little overlap of the, the edge of the table. And then we've got Jim's pant leg. I'll flip it around his foot. And there's his one leg. And there's his other leg, his other foot. So, <clears throat> there's, whoops, I'm so sorry. Again, I apologize when I slide off like that. I really do. Jim says there must be headphones in this picture. Absolutely. Okay. All right. Jim needs some headphones. So we'll give Jim some, some big, ridiculous headphones that look like earmuffs. Right? And then uh, you know, how they sit over top of his, his noggin there. We'll give him a cartoon here. Like a child's drawing. So, so with this in mind, we've now established, we've identifiably drawn a character within space in an environment using these different shapes to build up all the parts of it and at the same time to understand. Now, we look at this and we have a sense of character in space with objects around them and uh, trying to figure out all the different facets of the drawing. Now, you know, our care, our drawing of Jim is, he's not wearing a shirt, but I also haven't defined his, his, you know, full anatomy of his, of his chest, but that's okay because again, this is just a basic drawing. Um, Jim says, uh, that's my happy place. <laughs> and Chris asks if Jim's left-handed. Uh, no, right, but it, I believe I'm comp uh, contemplating in this drawing. Well, you know, why I drew you with the left hand, I don't know. But, so, the point is, is that breaking everything down into these shapes, and even if we have to use different colored pencils in order to find the different planes in our drawing, allows us to build up more and more the image that we're putting down you know we've you know we've got jim in space we can have jim here's the table beside jim with the coffee cup on it and his his ipad and we draw it like a line that's sticking on top and look a pencil floating in the air and here's his chair you know the level of complexity there's i'm sorry here's the stuff i was off screen really got to get better at this but let me move this back out a little bit so the complexity of how we draw as long as we start with a basic idea of things and we stick to it and we continue to develop our approach we're going to get more i keep using the word sophisticated but we're going to get more um improved i guess works as well with how it is that we're drawing things and how it is that we're looking at things now one person watching this might not draw in fact i'm going to promise you one person that's watching this is not going to draw exactly the same way as the person beside him or her and it's just there's so much going on with you and so much in how you see things and so much how you interpret things from your head to your hand as you're drawing that is so unique compared to everyone around you, to everybody else in the world. You are going to naturally gravitate to different things. You're going to have a different aesthetic. You're going to look at different pictures and uh, then the next person enjoy, appreciate those and dislike those. And they may well be the opposite. You're going to have a different uh, sense of understanding about how the world works with you. Maybe you took some drafting classes or engineering classes in high school. You know, um, you you know you've got a more vivid imagination than the next person, or, or you don't. But the more that you allow yourself the ability to start simply, my own panel, my panel, to start simply and how you look at the world around you and assess it, the more that you can start here and move to here and move from here to placing that chair within the context. See what I did? I missed the leg. 
There's the leg of Jim's chair, and then there is the other leg of Jim's chair. So the more that you have the allowance for yourself to do that, the more that you can be able to break down objects in space, whether they're you know, organically shaped like people or they're very geometrically shaped like you know, people made objects. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, let me catch up. Uh, Chris says, nice. <laughs> hey, Chris, I love how yesterday's comic turned out. Oh, well, thank you very much, Jen Ren. Jen says hi to everybody. Uh, funny, I wanted to be a drafter when I was in high school. Drafting is one of those things where um, I don't have an affinity for drafting. I really don't. I am not. I'm a guesstimator. I just am, you know, it's the whole measure, measure twice, cut once. I got to measure like three or four times for a cut. And it's only because I just, I just, I just can't rest on the number. It looks like it could be this from that angle and that from me. And, and I'm just an absolute nuisance to myself. When I finished the second floor of our house, um, you know, there's, a lot of really tight joints and the reason that there's a lot of really tight joints is is that I would always overestimate on my measurements and so when it came to drafting forget it I <laughs> I just I don't have that level of exactitude that uh, drafters require I'm far too uh, flippity jibbity far too wishy-washy scientific terms okay um, so there is us breaking down a scene. Now, the more elaborate that we want to get with the scene is where you start drawing other tables and other people moving around in the environment, or maybe you have a view of the back counter or the counter of the coffee shop and, you know, that has, uh, let's say donuts inside the glass cabinet or, um, People standing behind, what do you call uh, coffee people, baristas, I think it is, or coffee shop employees, whatever. Um, but you've got the people working behind the counter. you got people working at a cash register, you know. Um, and it's, it's funny, you know, by association and, and by allowing yourself to tuck into your own memory, you're going to start, as long as you let yourself go into that flow, into that imagination flow, you'll start remembering all these different aspects of coffee shops from the times that you've been in coffee shops. And the reason that I close my eyes when I do this is that there's a part of me that just visualizes things in, inside my head. I, I, it's probably ridiculous looking, but it is what it is. Uh, like, um, here, let's, if you look at this boxy shape that sits on the counter and, uh, and it has a slight angle to it. It's like I cut off a triangle, right? We don't see that part. And uh, and it has another triangular shape at the front. And then you'll you get a little little display up here on the pediment. But what this is 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 the the cash machine that somebody's did 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 it, and it's four seventy five. And up here it says four seventy five. Nowadays they don't even look like that. Nowadays a lot of coffee shops will just have a tablet on a pedestal, you think about the mounting bracket of the pedestal, and then you think about the base of the pedestal, and as it sits on a counter like so, and the person just goes, you know, tick, 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 for, you know, 1450 for your coffee now. So, Chris says it's a barista. Thank you, Chris. Um, <clears throat> I thought it was a barista. I wasn't entirely sure. So the barista will turn into the saber tooth. Thank you. I forgot about the saber tooth. I, I've even got it written down here. Come on, Christopher. Thank you, Chris. Thank you for reminding me. Saber tooth. So let's think about a big cat, right? Now, a saber tooth cat, you know, with the shape of a cat's head, okay, that it's got its little pudgy nose, and as its pudgy nose sits like so, and it's got its big eyes, and then it's got its little ears up here. And we're thinking about the, see again, triangular shape. There's a square shape sitting there, the triangular piece at the bottom that goes into the big, wonderful round circle. There's our triangular eye. We know that the nose breaks down. So you can see how we're now breaking down all these parts of the face of a cat. 
Okay, so when we're thinking about cat and, and, and the shape of a cat as it sits in space, you know, and the more that we're able to, in our mind's eye, remember what a cat looks like, you know, which I have a really hard time with. I never see cats. Corbin's having a nap right now in the next room. Uh, I was up all night. I couldn't sleep, so Corbin was up with me looking at me like, why are we not sleeping right now? You know. So, okay, so as we've got our cat and we set our cat in space and we know that our cat's body goes like so and we break down shapes of a cat. So what we're doing is that we're thinking about how the cat moves, you know, in, in space and how it builds up, okay? So it's it's important that we have a, a, a realistic understanding of how that would work. So then when we think about a big cat, you know, this is where you might want to tuck into some, some kind of visual resource so that you can see the big cat's eyes and how they work in its, its forehead and how a, a cat's brow furrows because it's not the same way. When we squinch up, our forehead. This, this is the this is the place to get a screen cap. If we scrunch up our forehead and we're mad, well, when a cat does it, there's there's a different shape to this forehead to this brow. So you know we gotta try to have some degree of understanding of that, and then the placement of its nose is so much higher. Anyhow, let's put it in uh, the environment with Jim. Uh, we got another. Yeah, that shows. Okay. The first uh, turn into the saber tooth. Thank you. I appreciate you reminding me about the saber tooth. When I'm drawing on my iPad, I'm looking out for saber tooth tiger attacks. So let's say in the environment, okay, there's another table here. Okay, there's a longer table in the background over here. We know it's got its chairs that are sitting at it. And, uh, all right, and they sit underneath the table, and then there's the legs of the table, and then this table's got the same legs, almost on the same height, but it's just slightly tilted back a tiny bit. And then there's uh, the chair. Well, we won't put a chair in between because that's not very uh, facilitating to, to have somebody crammed in between, banging between the tables. We want the customers to be able to move around and come back to the counter and order things. You know, so we're building up the environment around Jim, putting things in perspective. So as these lines all move to, you know, a relative position in space, okay? And, uh, and then we'll have our counter. I really should have drawn the whole thing in and maybe not. I got a problem with when I'm doodling, I draw on top of myself all the time. Um, I have any examples here? Um, yeah, here, look. So as I'm scribbling these different characters, I draw a car exploding over top of this guy. Or right, I've got these panel layouts here and I'm scribbling forms for just basic shapes for people running with laser pistols and, and, and fish bowls on their heads, or here's a person who's flying back through the air as he shoots his, his zapper, you know, and then, you, you know, even that's got shapes underneath the, the spaceship picture, or you can see bicycle on top of the target, uh, you know, a bear in a boat on top of this, you know, fantastical character. Here's spaceships and girders on top of it. So, I have a habit of doing that, and I apologize if it makes it more difficult to understand what it is that I'm drawing. Uh, we're at an hour. We're doing really good, guys. So, okay, so as I'm drawing this counter in place, right, and I'm thinking about, now, if you need to use a ruler, use a ruler, right? This is just a rough drawing, but see that the box is on the same, roughly the same angle as what we've got Jim sitting at. So as we draw 
this environment behind him. We'll put a beveled lip on the, the counter. We know that we can drop out the counter like so, and then put an angled display inside of it that is full of layers of donuts, right? So all these little things, and we get more and more involved as we could draw it. So, but this would be our place. When I'm drawing on my iPad, I look out for saber tooth tiger attacks. So as we've got, let's draw, there's a cake under here in the glass container, right? We'll put some glasses on a tray on top. So as we've got all these glasses here, so we're just adding a little more depth to our picture. And then where this counter moves out, and we'll have the, here's our barista to scale in, in the background. Let's have her wave, hi. So this is where you can put, and there's the gap between this counter and the next. And this is where would be a great place for us to put our sabers to tiger. It's because Jim is always looking out for saber tooth tigers while he's working on his iPad. Um, now, if you want to get really creative, you can keep building on to this complexity. Okay, we can put, we can have more people standing in the space in relationship to the scale of Jim. Okay, and we can have these, and I'm just going to do really basic shapes like this, where everybody looks like they're wearing cloaks. You know, we've got somebody who's sitting here at this table, talking to somebody who's sitting on the opposite side of it. Now, I like soup. I like soup. You know, who knows what they're talking about. <clears throat> and then, you know, we and then you can get even more creative than that. You can have, like, here's somebody who's leaning over as they're farting around with something on the floor like they've got you know heavy bags or something like that and as their body contorts like you know as it bends forward contorts is the wrong word uh as they bend forward and there's a slight bend to their legs all of these things and this is the reason that i'm doing this is all of these little things that add more complexity to the overall image when we do draw the saber tooth tiger, and as it's, you know, moving through here, and it's, there's its paw, and as it's coming from the counter, now, let me, the structure of its face would be like this, that would be an up curl, Kind of that thing with the gum line. So there'll be a little pursing of the lip there, like that sort of shape. And then here's our our big saber tooth tiger teeth that are peeking through. And then as it's stalking poor Jim, just innocent young man just trying to draw his his animations on his laptop. But as we draw rest of the structure of the face of the saber tooth's head. I'm not sure what a saber tooth looks like. But I'm just sort of drawing a cat with big teeth and a far more pronounced um, upper lip because it has to contain said big teeth. So it's probably not very very identifiably saber tooth tiger, but that's where you start looking at. A little more depth in your drawing reference or or, or shapes. So we've got there's the bottom teeth kicking through, you know. Boy, oh boy, how do they keep their teeth like that? Like, is it a natural thing where you don't have to brush? Something to do with their diet, maybe. So, and as we've got this shoulder, like you see me define here, and then there's the arch of the back. And I don't, do they, did they say, I guess they're tigers, they have tails. So... 
so it draw its tail. But the idea here is that the structure of its arm, its shoulder, there's the front part of its leg. So it's peeking through as though it's, you know, it's, it's crawling its way through the counter here. And then it's forward pause extended out. Am I in frame? Nope. That's forward pause extended out. So they get the sense of our tiger moving through the space. And there's his tail moving that way. And his, his, this hip is raised as this hip is stretched forward. Anyways, that's my <coughs> part of me. So, so this is my point is, is that this isn't, um, Chris says it looks amazing. Oh, that's nice. Uh, in art journals, I think that that is a cool effect drawing over yourself. It takes you forever to go through a journal though. I've got three on the go simultaneously and I get out of control at this. Like here is, this is just scribbling figures. And you can see how they're just constantly drawing over top of each one, right? And I, I mean, to the point of just absolute lunacy. And, you know, I'll start to play watercolor or stuff like that in there. And, but I'm just playing with shapes and forms and bodies. I guess this would be better if I did it this way. So, you know. So I've talked about a few different things over the course of some of these, you know, sharing of ideas that I'm doing. I keep saying tutorials, but I don't know. Um, I talked about all the different ways that we can make marks to do stuff. And I uh, hope oh, Jen says that the tiger's chewing on bones and ligaments. With those teeth, it was easy for them to prey on huge animals at those prehistoric times. Um, it looks werewolfish. <laughs> yeah, there you go. I love it. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't really look like a, a tiger. Um, so I've talked about a few different things. I talked about all the different, this is where I showed you these things, where all the different mark-making tools and ways that we can interpretate and interpret, interpret the same thing uh, using different mark-making materials. You know, I've talked about how we can look at um, what the point of interest of our composition is or what, you know, the focus should be for your, for, for your drawing, all the different things you can draw upon. I've talked about, you know, structural ways of us looking at things and making the eye move and the reader follow with us through the drawing. But I realized that I've been remiss in the fact that all this talk about just draw this and draw that in that place and that made me forget about the fact that we need to talk about like a basic starting point of a way of seeing, I'm sorry, a way of seeing in order for us to, to draw whatever things. As much as it is about using, utilizing whatever shapes it is that you need to utilize for uh, drawing uh, whatever it is that you're, you're drawing for your story. It's hand in hand, the basic application and practice of figuring out all the different things that we can try to draw and all the different breakdowns of how to build those things up to draw them. I think it goes hand in hand with the part of yourself that can have a, uh, a more full consideration of the environment, the characters that are in it, you know, the, the complexity of, of the things that we're drawing. With that in mind, I'm a big proponent of basic. And what I mean by that is, uh, I would suggest looking at people like Alex Toth, A-L-E-X-T-O-T-H, uh, Mike Mignola, M-I-K-E, M-I-G-N-O-L-A, uh, and, and creators like that, 
you know, um, the reason that I would suggest some of these guys, uh, and these are sequential illustrators primarily, uh, might bring to a comics. Uh, but Alex Toth designed so many animated shows and the characters for those and the environments for those and the settings for those. And what these two people that I've cited for you, another one would be David Latham, by the way, but he's, again, not as simplistic in line. So maybe rather than Latham, I'd say Darwin Cook. Uh, D-A-R-W-Y-N-C-O-O-K-E. Um, because, and he's specifically comics as well. Uh, another a person who designs uh, storyboards and animations is, uh, oh, I've forgotten his name now. It's not Yadorowski. It's, if anybody remembers, it's a guy who's, who's, uh, who's done Samurai Jack. Look at that uh, artist. Uh, oh my goodness, I love the page of eyes. Well, Jen, take a look at the mark making thing in my YouTube thing. Have you have any of this published? Have any books published? Uh, we're about to put out our 31st book. But have I done anything about how to draw published? No, this is me starting to try to develop that. Um, so yeah, there's a tutorial where it talks about all these different ways that you can that you can use marks to make eyes. Different uh, surfaces, different applications on top of those surfaces. There's one of those talks that I did is about that. Um, Wallywood would be another good one. Uh, you know, it's it's just look at some of these illustrators, and I would really st stick with. Uh, uh, Toth and Mignola as two primaries. Uh, but Toth also shows fantastically directional movement or the idea of uh, the tension and a person moving across the screen, a car going over a dune and flying a little bit through the air, uh, an overweight guy on a surfboard you know, with the goatee and and uh, and uh, a flat cap. You know, uh, there's so much wildness to to the different things that he would illustrate and dragsters and whatever other things uh, over time uh, through his career. In addition to all the storyboarding and the breakdowns for animation, so um, but he'll he'll show you simplistic information that you need to convey the scene and the situation. It doesn't have to be this absolutely elaborate 90s-esque, tons of tiny lines, uh, artwork that uh, is so prevalent and so still so influential in, in, uh, in illustration today, specifically forms of storytelling, is that there was a lot of more involved application in the 90s in the information that was in the art and that's just still carried over ever since. But unfortunately, what was really strong before that was purposeful storytelling. And since the flourish has taken hold in the 90s, the storytelling isn't... There are fine examples of people that are brilliantly strong at it, Mignola being one. Um, but it it's a different level before that. It's functional over fabulous, I guess. Um, okay, I will watch it. It's easy to tell which video it is. Just go on my YouTube page, look down in the, in the playlist, and there's one there. Uh, I have an amazing imagination, and I love your chats like this. It's very nice of you. Um, we all have imaginations. This is the, the second component part I'm still talking about. Shapes, but how we see, and how we relate, and how we understand. Anybody can develop the most brilliant drawing skills. But oftentimes you'll see people that have this absolute mastery of drawing cool characters. But they never draw those characters in context. Well, that's not true to say never. But 
a lot of those people that have this fantastic developed ability of drawing these really cool characters, and that's what they're hired a lot of time in a lot of places for. Um, they haven't developed the ability to see them in an environment, to see them in a context, to see them in in uh, a situation. And their, their cool illustration of their character, the character still might not have function to it because they haven't figured out how these gnarly looking legs that the thing has actually work. You know, like, do they, do they move like so, where, you know, you've got this counterposition to to this, you know, the structural form of the leg. And so that this touch part here, the, where the toes are and the gripping of it, and there's a slight little pad on the bottom part of the heel for when it does make contact for the additional exertion of force and all the bending applications that are in here and the leg of, of a cat, and the, the power in these muscles that are up here and this energy as it flows through and it just drives those back legs to move a cat flying forward. I'm sorry, I did it off panel. So to move the, these different aspects so that when the cat pushes with those hind legs, they go flying. I mean, there's a, a huge kinetic buildup that's going to be applied in releasing these muscles. But that has a lot to do with the you know, the sugar information that's sent through your body and, and, and able to and it doesn't matter. So as much as it is that anybody can figure out how to draw anything as, as they can see it or they can, they can replicate it or they can develop a skill to draw cool people in, in X amount of poses or, or continually draw pre-existing characters. Um, there's something else to be said for allowing yourself the second half of it and tapping into seeing the world and imagining things from that and allowing yourself to take this comprehension, this basic understanding that you have of how things work together and how an object is built up. A tree is, 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 is grown up, you know, how, how a tree grows over time, how, the difference of our body and our slightly larger heads as we're little kids, as opposed to um, our more settled, you know, proportions as we become adults, you know, and then the crooking or the, the slouching of those proportions as we become more aged, you know, um, and it, it, there's, there's all these different ways to associate the world whether it's the world of the real or the worlds that we imagine. And then the shapes and the drawing part is interpreting them. And it works on the same level as writing soundtracks and music to denote this world, that, you know, in the scenarios and the situations and the emotions. Or it's the same thing as, um, you know, writing text in order to accommodate this world vision that we're developing or this world vision that we're interpreting. It's, it's, you've got to have both parts. So as much as you can practice and practice and, and develop and take time for yourself to do those parts, take time for yourself to do the other. And I think that there'll be a greater sense of fullness to your drawing process for yourself. I think it'll allow you two things. One is to forgive yourself that you're not perfect and your every drawing isn't going to be absolutely perfect because we're just people. You become more um, accomplished in having drawings that the result of them is more to your liking as you develop. But, you know, we can never know everything. The more that we know, the more that we know that we don't know. We can never, you know, figure out how to draw everything on the planet unless we take the time to think it through and, and do so. So, okay, both parts of that. Uh, Chris says, good advice. Oh, well, that's nice. Yeah, thanks. Got to go a bunch of time. See you around. Thanks, Chris, for, for joining us. I appreciate that. So, yeah, so if, if I can suggest anything, you know, there's the drawing. Can you see that? Yeah, I'll write it in black. 
there's two approaches to this. One is the drawing, right? And I'll put the shapes on that side. And then the other half of it is the thinking. And, you know, this is where the imagination part kicks in. And this is imagination. This is facilitation for you fancy people. And so what I'm referring to in that is that, uh, and I'll write idea, ideas right here, ideas, shapes, see? So as much as your drawing is going to facilitate the storytelling that you need to do and all the rules therein and all of the structure and, you know, the different applications that you have in order to inform yourself to do so better. Uh, it's, you're lost if you don't have the ability to, to see, to have a deeper understanding, uh, which is an album by uh, War on Drugs, really great album. Um, okay. Chris says, or I'm sorry, Jen says, Jen says, I definitely get stifled in perfection. I end up not doing anything because of my fear of perfection. Um, okay, well, before I wrap up, let's talk to this. Uh, try this. The next thing that you're going to draw, um, one, lose the preciousness of the drawing. Let's just start there, right? Let go of the preciousness of your thing. This is a messy activity. Is this a finished thing? No, but I could lay this on a light table, put another sheet of paper over top of it, and I've got the whole, all the breakdowns here for my drawing. I just refine it a little bit better as I'm finishing it. But whatever it is that you're drawing, take your pencil and a regular. Here's a regular old piece of graphite. Take a piece of graphite, find a piece of paper, even better if the paper's got smudges and junk on it, and do this. Okay? Now draw on top of it. It sounds crazy. The reason it sounds crazy and for a moment is because you've, you're, you're seeing an imperfect surface to draw on. You're seeing an imperfect image that's going to come out of it because it's going to have this business there. But it's no different than... Um, okay, here, I've got different surfaces that I will draw images on top of. This is some of the jelly plating and wearing and, and painted surfaces and colored card stocks and blemished papers that, uh, different types of paper. None of this matters to me because it's the application on top, the storytelling part that's my interest. So I did this earlier this week, I think. So here's this week's, now this is drawn on a white piece of paper, yesterday's page. Um, the day before, this is a jelly plated paper that has been drawn straight with a, a pen and uh, some paint markers. You know, and before that, we had uh, straight on paint markers on craft paper. And before that, we had um, mixed media surface with all kinds of tissue papers and things that we did pen, uh, pen drawings on. So this is just pen on a, a piece of paper. You know, this is white pencil on a, a red piece of heavy cardstock. This is a dipping pen on, on a, a thick uh, Stonehenge paper. There's graphite. None of this matters. None of them. Here's in the graphite. Here's a great chance to see their scribbles on this page to let go of the preciousness of it. You can see them in the forehead of the guy at the glasses, or you can see them scribbled around. The Justin Trudeau ball is getting smacked in here. Um, so point is, that's not a posturing thing. What I'm trying to get across to is the surface doesn't matter. It just doesn't. It's what you do with it. It's how you uh, take all those ideas and you facilitate what it is that you want to execute on there. 
So make a lot of mistakes. Make as many mistakes as you can. And allow yourself that. If you draw the same face eight times on the same piece of paper, you'll see the differences between them. You just will, because the more you apply these foundational rules that you've made up to approach the face, the more you're going to have a face that you like. So, uh, Jen says, no, that's perfect. no such thing as perfect. Um, okay, so uh, it's, I can draw more things that people are interested in seeing, or maybe I'll make something of this for tomorrow's page I'll post. Um, <clears throat> but whatever it is, right there, right there and right there that's that's your three shapes and the interaction of those so take a look at some objects around you and take a look at you know whatever's in the environment that you're in right now that doesn't mean you have to draw them in the moment but just look at them and look for the shapes in them and uh Remember that, like, okay, in the case of here's a, a tubular shape, we'll just, I'll just show you one thing, okay? So if this is the chair that's sitting here in my library, uh, the other half of my studio, so as I see this chair that's sitting over here in front of the, one of the bookshelves, and I have an understanding of where it sits in space in relationship to to um, the perspective from where I'm sitting um, and I'm drawing so I started doing this sort of I know that if I extend this out and I lost the green there it is there's a circle there there's a circle there there's a circle there you know there's a square attached to said circle Right? Same thing here. There's a circle at that side too. That's what makes it the tube at the top. As long as, you know, in, in the space that this sits in, see how it's the, the line matches the line over here without us having to draw this. Over time, you start eliminating lines. Over time, you just start seeing the structure of the thing and picking and choosing the lines that you put down. But we don't do that until we start with looking at the shapes of everything. So, yeah, have fun, do so. Yeah, it's, it's stare around the room, see what you see. Uh, okay, that's, uh, I hope that's a benefit to people in the course of talking about drawing things with shapes. We've drawn our story, and thank you, Jim, for the suggestion. Uh, <laughs> if I know it's meant to be one or not. Uh, Jen says, I need to trust myself more. We all do. We all do. I like the scribble on paper idea. Yeah, just make a mess of your paper. Right? Scribble, 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 and then erase half of it. You know, and then draw on top of that. And, uh, and I think everybody needs to trust yourself is one way of looking at it. Forgive yourself is another. You're just a person. We're all just people. I'm, I'm, I only have so much strength as an illustrator. There's other people that are far stronger than I am. But does that matter in my journey and in my place? No, it just doesn't. Um, because I'm on the road that I'm on, and they're on the roads that they're on. And the, the sooner that we can look at um, the individual uniqueness of our, each of ourselves and, and trying to figure out what it is that we're wanting to say and what stories we want to tell, then the stronger will be for it. I'm, uh, I love Caravaggio. I'm not Caravaggio. You know, so allow everybody allow yourselves that. And thank you very much for coming and hanging out. I appreciate everybody joining us today. I hope that there's some information here that has helped people. And uh, I really appreciate people checking out. Check out the Instagram, check out the Facebook and see the daily pages posted there. If you want to see the original art for those, I got a Patreon, it's $3 a month. And I post all the stuff that uh, that I do uh, and the original art uh, there before the finished image 
uh, that is posted on Facebook and Instagram. So, uh, and then there's additional things that I'll do on weekends. Uh, I have, a, you know, I, I, I have a bad habit of drawing while I'm at places where other people should be listening. I am listening. I'm just drawing while I'm doing it. So I post those on, on there as well. But uh, again, that's just if you're interested in that stuff. So uh, otherwise, I'll be back tomorrow. We'll be doing uh, another uh, another piece, getting another one started. If anybody has any questions or, or, or uh, things that uh, they want to suggest for story ideas or three-word prompts for, for things to work on, you're more than welcome to do so. Uh, we did 358 out of 365 days last year. And um, there's no part of me that's invested that I have to do 365 this year. Um, but we're having fun, you know. And when you have fun, you forget about those quantities and those expectations, unless it's a bang job and you got to do what you got to do. But um, when it comes to this, we're just exploring. So feel free to take part and uh, involve yourself in that process. And uh, more importantly, do your thing. All right. Bye for now, everybody. Thank you very much, everyone. I appreciate you coming out. Everybody's saying thanks. Have a great day. Thank you very much. I appreciate everybody coming and joining us. Jen, you had great observations. Yes, indeed, she did. She did, indeed. Uh, thank you very much, Suni. Thank you very much, uh, everybody that's joined us on the chat today. And uh, I'll be back 2 p.m. EST tomorrow. Bye for now.